the U.S. people celebrated a Halloween festival. Okay. <clears throat> there. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> this is these are pictures that I took in Key West, Florida, and I'm going to show you where Key West is, and uh, kind of zoom through these fast. This is uh, in Key West, a, a bunch of people that gather. In fact, it's, they're there right now because it's the Halloween weekend that, that they do this fantasy fest. Here is a picture of uh, Florida, the bottom of Florida. You'll notice Miami here on the upper right-hand corner, Hollywood and Miami. There's US-1. That's the highway that goes right by where we live. Uh, and we're in uh, central Florida on the East Coast. Then you come down US-1, and these are the Florida Keys. And uh, all these uh, uh, red with, um, with a white stripe, those are dive sites uh, for scuba diving. Down here at the lower left is Key West, Florida. It's the last key where the highway stops, OK? Here is a picture of the what is known as mile marker zero right here, mile marker zero. And that's me on, the, <laughs> on my scooter me on my scooter at the beginning of US-1, okay? Here's another picture. This, the, uh, one of these people is real, that's me. The other person is a statue <laughs> in Key West. Okay, this is a, the, it's called a march. It's a um, parade. Here we go. These are Halloween costumes done every year. They're, they did that this year. Um, this is, um, these are uh, body painting and sometimes, uh, a lot of times. And I'll just kind of cruise through these pictures rather rapidly. These are all costumes. Key West is a very interesting place. Here's a banker. <laughs> <laughs> People really get into this. H1N1, now this is, these pictures were taken some years ago. H1N1 is a swine flu, in case you don't remember. Yeah, I remember. Okay. okay. People really get into this. They have a lot of fun uh, decorating themselves uh, in their costumes. Person in the middle is real. The person to his, on his right shoulder is not. Are you sure? Because, yes. <laughs> a lot of times people uh, get their bodies painted they um, enjoyed having their picture taken and I was a photographer and you'll notice people are looking right at me very interesting <laughs> Key West is is an interesting place yeah absolutely everybody gets into it including those in wheelchairs. The rat on his shoulder is not real, Minji. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You'll notice they're looking right at me. I was pretty close. And they like these, everyone likes to have their picture taken. Now we shift to night. This is Sloppy Joe's Bar, very well known in Key West. That's where uh, Hemingway hung out, Ernest Hemingway. Wow. Really into this one, uh, this gal was kind of scary, really. Uh, it was too real. <laughs> so do people buy these costumes or do they make them themselves? Uh, no, there are people that are, well, some of these, now this, this couple did, a, did, did that themselves. Uh, some of them, the body painting oftentimes is done by local artists in Key West. 
I enjoyed these two guys. Yeah, the Romans. Yes. <laughs> okay, that's the end of it. That's uh, all. That's all for me. Thank you very much, um, Gary. Uh, what I didn't know was Halloween is actually. I I always thought Halloween people just children. Family goes family to family, household to household for trick and treat. What I didn't realize and I learned from your presentation is people actually use it as in a big costume party. Uh, oh, yes. <clears throat> so how long yeah. has it been like this? Is it always the case or was it very recent? Well, uh, you know, I met a woman in, um, in, in Sloppy Joe's at the, at the counter where they sell um, stuff. And uh, I said, um, I was here um, quite a while, quite years ago, and I said, "When did you first start uh, uh, at the at the convention here at the Fantasy Fest?" And she said, "25 years ago." Wow! So, so it's been running a long time. Yeah, uh, we wish this festival could continue. Maybe next year uh, after yes. 2020. Uh, thanks for giving us an uh, original, authentic view of what's happened, like what used to. Last year, how people celebrated and all going back 25 years ago. Now, I think one of the hosts, uh, Joanna, she's very ready in her in her hat and costume to tell us a story from Romania and a European point of view, a folk story. So, if we like, we can ping her so you can see Joanna um, in, in a bigger in a, in a bigger screen for Joanna. I love your hat, Joanna. Uh, thank you. I'm just trying to. Uh, one second, because you didn't share the right screen. We are all learning about Zoom this year. Yeah. So you can see the screen? Yes. OK, so I'm going to tell you a little story. The sun is starting to set and the night takes over, bringing it with it darkness, fear and frightening noises. Tonight is the night that everybody fears. Tonight is St. Andrew's night, the one time a year when the Strigoi gets out to hunt. Strigoi, you might wonder, what is that? A creature that is half man and half wolf, possessed by a spirit hungry for blood. Tonight, the dead are coming out of their graves to drink blood and suck life, to bring disease and sorrow. Tonight, the animals can talk to each other, but who listens to them must die. Tonight, nobody gets on the streets in the village. They are running wild, looking for victims. They will eat animals which are not in their stables. They will attack everyone who dares to get out after dark. In the morning, you will know who's been fighting with the wolves because of the scars on their faces. To protect from Strigoi, one must rub garlic all over your body, hair, and a forehead. Young women must rub garlic on every door and window frame. Put crosses over each door, window, and chimney, and hang strings of garlic in the middle of each room in the house. If you have cattle, make a cross with wax on their forehead and lock the stable doors. Women must finish their work in the kitchen before midnight and must not use sharp objects after. They're also forbidden to comb their hair. Men must hide their sights as the Strigoi will use them as weapons to fight. Midnight has come and the sky opens up, letting the Strigoi out. They go from house to house trying to find one that's not prepared. They will ask, are you home? Are you home? If you answer, you will remain mute for, a, for eternity. The Strigoi fight and then they dance and then they fight and then they dance again until the first crows of the roosters in the morning. Then they pull the bells of the church and disappear where they came from. They'll come back again next year.
Thank you, Joanna. We love the uh, purple lipstick and uh, yeah. the fact that we can't cope our hair tonight. So is that in a, a famous Romania folk story? How did you learn about it? Yeah, it's actually the St. Andrew's Night. So St. Andrew's Night is actually at the end of November, not the end of October. So it's on the 30, 30th of, yeah, 29 till the 30th of um, November. And it's um, actually, this, these are the origins of Dracula. Uh, these legends come from when Romania was inhabited by the Dutch, which were the ancient tribes that were living on the land like way before Christ. So in like the first century before Christ. And um, they, they were conquered by Romans in, um, in the first century after Christ. But these are their legends. Like the wolf used to be their um, protecting animal. Right. Yeah. So yeah. All the folklore comes from there. And that's why there's the garlic garlic is really, really important, like garlic protects you. And that's why um, Dracula is afraid of garlic. Uh, also crosses, it's all, all, everything happens at night. So when the, the, the light comes out, like when the, the first, when the sun starts to rise, they have to disappear, they have to go away where they came from. So again, this is, uh, it has something, to, it, it, this inspired uh, the legend of Dracula. Again, they drink blood. Yes, we, uh, we, we from next week, we're going to have the second lockdown in the UK. And I know what I need to get, a lot of garlic. A lot of garlic. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of garlic for our winter. So it's kind of spooky, created the atmosphere for us to continue. Uh, for the first round, we're just missing one Asian perspective. And here I want to invite uh, Sumili in Japan uh, to tell us the story of, is it Kappa story? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. So I'd like to show you two Japanese folk monsters. So first one, so he is, this is, we call him Kappa. Yeah. So it's a cross between a child and a frog. It lives in a river or a pond. People, uh, Japanese are afraid of it uh, because it pulls people into the water. And it has a plate here, plate, uh, like hollow on its head. And uh, if it loses water in the hole, it's believed to lose its supernatural power, yeah. And uh, he loves to do small wrestling. <laughs> and also his favorite food is cucumber. <laughs> so Japanese call cucumber sushi roll, uh, kappa maki, maki means rolling. So kappa rolling means cucumber sushi rolls. <laughs> Actually, uh, my daughter was in my belly uh, actually, I had a terrible morning sickness, and all I could eat was just only kappamaki, cucumber sushi rolls. So uh, seriously, I was so afraid that uh, my baby maybe kappa. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I and hope uh, she's not. I hope she turns out not to be a kappa. Yeah, so, yeah. so fortunately, uh, she was a human. Yeah, I really, you can relax. And also, sec second, so folk, Japanese folk monster, she's nowadays, it's very, very famous monster called Amabie. And Amabie has three legs and uh, long hair, and actually, she's kind of a mermaid, Japanese mermaid. And uh, uh, about 170 years ago, in 1846, Amabie emerged from the ocean uh, and told an official, uh, she, she said that if disease spreads, show a picture of me to those who fall ill and uh, will be cured. 
So just actually after the COVID-19, uh, Japanese social media users spread her images in hopes of a quick end to outbreak. So now all Japanese knows this monster, Amabie, and also we have a lot of charms. Can I say that? Charms. So he is Amabie. So my friends just made me from scratch. So this is Amabie. So mm -hmm. actually, so she's a very good monster. Yes, good monster. And so Japanese yeah, love her now. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> can you yes, show us the, how to spell Amabia? We can research about this little mermaid. Yeah, sorry. So this is a very rough handwriting, but A-M-A-B-I-E. A-M-A-B-I-E. And I hope it's working out. For, for you this year, I hope. Yes, with... yeah. So actually, so now you can see Amabie. So that means no more COVID-19 for everyone. Yes, good luck. <laughs> we, we all need our uh, Amabie this year. Yes, yes. yes. The situation. Yes. Yeah, thank you. And your friend is very nice. She made this Amabie charm out of scratch. Yes, yes, from scratch. Yeah, so, so so this is my wallet. So always I have it. Yeah, you know. That's so. beautiful. Good. Yeah, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Lovely. Yes, lovely. Yes. <laughs> uh, thanks for kind of cute uh, cup of story. Uh, yeah. The cucumber sushi roll uh, is yes. really top of it. And also the uh, charm, uh, the little mermaid, Japanese mermaid that will get out us out of trouble this yes. year. So we had our first round uh, and a perspective from the States, how people celebrate Halloween with huge parades and makeups and then a perspective from Romania, which teach us what to get for our second lockdown this year. And uh, uh, hopefully with a little blessing from the uh, uh, Japanese I'm a beer charm. We will all get uh, finished 2020 uh, on a slightly higher note. Mm. Um, I want to share now uh, how we came up with this idea to have people from around the world tell and a little bit folk story. Uh, generated from uh, a conversation I had with Mike. Uh, Mike is writing a book about story structure. Uh, we were taking a walk and we talked about in when he's reading about Russian folk tales, how people actually uh, discover there might be a common formula, a common recipe in all these folk stories, folk tales. You always would have the atmosphere, the character, and then the plot will be something happened to the character. How does he or she feel? Uh, which kind of plan this person has? Or, Sometimes it's not a person, it's an animal, or it's a half animal, half person. And the actual behavior action it took and the consequences and eventually how he or she felt. And if this character get rewarded, uh, that's in a pretty standard formula. We, we don't know uh, actually if this is true for every nation, every culture, uh, that's how I thought, okay, maybe we can have this Halloween special for people to get together and share uh, the story, the content, and the plot of your folk tales. Now, I actually would want to do something quite creative. Uh, I will try to see if this is going to work. Can you all see this screen? Yes. This is a screen of my mobile phone and I just downloaded an app called Story Dice. <coughs> what I will do now is I will press the app and this is the nine dices from the uh, app. I will start by a small, very small game. I will ask three people to pick up, each of you to pick up one dice and we're going to create a character together. All right. We'll start from me. And I will choose the football in the middle of this dice game interface. And I will say, once upon a time, there's an Akapa who's half frog, 
has human and he loves playing football. I am now going to invite somebody else. Maybe I can invite Mike. Mike, do you want to continue the story by picking up a dice over there? You need to unmute yourself, Mike. Okay, all right. Um, so he loved playing football. The, um, so I'll take the dice and the middle on the right. And he loved playing football, but the problem was he lived on a tiny little island. That, that island was so small, it only had two little trees on it. And so to play football, he had to play it round and round in circles or to use the two trees as a goal for football. He was getting very bored with playing such a small game of football. So we, thank you, Mike. We have the uh, Kappa uh, who likes to play football, but due to the uh, limitation of his living environment on the island, he's getting bored. I'm going to invite Lillian and Andrea in Singapore to continue the story. <laughs> Yeah, so we were choosing the, the, the first dice on the top left corner. And the, 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 the good thing about getting bored on this island is actually he was not alone. And there's a little girl and he's, they, they, they are having a drink together and they start chatting. So and the girl asks, what's wrong with you circling around this island and paying no attention to me? Um, what are you chasing? Are you chasing a little ball? What's the point of this game? Great. Now we uh, started a, a, in a conversation and then a girl slightly annoyed. The kappa wasn't paying enough attention to her. I'm going to invite Nicholas in Sweden. Uh, you can pick up a dice and complete the story for us for this round. <laughs> okay. Uh, they started chatting and having a drink together, and they got in. Uh, I was in. The, they started to disagree on how. I say how the football is good or not good, and it was like uh, they got the high temper, and uh, yeah, it was like I say. Uh, yeah, it uh, ended with. Uh, yeah, I would say uh, a fight. <laughs> throwing glasses on each other yeah. okay uh, this is our first experiment to create <laughs> a story on zoom using my mobile phone <laughs> eventually this uh, kappa who loved football end up uh, having a fight and a quarrel with a girl on a deserted island uh, so that's the first story now, coming to the second round, uh, we are going to invite Michelle. Michelle, are you there from Guatemala? Uh, Michelle, uh, we would love to hear a folktale from Guatemala. And at the same time, I'm going to ping you so I can see you in full screen. OK. Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle. I'm from Guatemala. And good morning to all of you, because here is 7.28 a.m. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk about El Sombrerón. I have a picture here, as you can see. I'm going to talk about him. So he was, he always was wearing an enormous hat, a black one, and dressed entirely in black with big boots, belt, and he used a guitar. The legend goes that a young girl like she... <laughs> <laughs> the legend goes that a young girl named Susanna was admiring the moon and the stars from her balcony. She was a beautiful girl with the long hair, as you can see, and big eyes. One night, she was approached and serenaded by the man in a big hat. It was called El Sombrerón. He fell in love with her and returned every night 
to serenade her with making it impossible for her to sleep. And whenever her parents will try to feed her, she will find the food contaminated with dirt. Worried and upset that their daughter was outside so late, Susanna's parents forced her to come inside and cut her hair. Naturally, this caused some brown to stop bothering her. He didn't like girls with pixie cuts. <laughs> Sombrerum is always looking for beautiful girls with long hair. And when he arrives in town with a pack of mules, and when he finds a woman he likes, he ties his mules outside her house and serenades her with a silver guitar. When he gets back home, he's known to serve them dirt for dinner, which renders them unable to sleep. In that way, he can win their soul. So, how can you know if a Sombrerong is around? He has a strange obsession with braiding. He often braids the tails of horses. <laughs> and if there is no horses around, sometimes braids the cats and dogs tails. So that's the end. <laughs> Thank you. What about the story? Some key lessons to learn from the story from Guatemala. If we want to stop sexual harassment, cut your hair short. <laughs> <laughs> and pay attention to your animals. <laughs> if they have friends, then you have a potential stalker around you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Michelle, for adding a little bit of a romantic feeling for our Halloween yeah. show. Now, I want to invite Jason uh, to tell us a uh, kind of a love story from China. Uh, Jason is new uh, today to our group. So Jason, would you like to first introduce yourself and then tell the story of the big love story for Chinese folktale? Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Jason from China now. Um, um, it's the first time to take part in this uh, um, uh, culture cultural uh, event. Uh, so I didn't. Uh, I don't uh, prepare uh, some materials. Uh, if uh, uh, if you are interested uh, in this story, I will find some materials, pictures uh, from the internet, and send in the group or uh, somewhere. So. Uh, I know William Shakespeare wrote a famous play named Romeo and Juliet, a love story and a tragedy. Uh, today, I'd like to share a Chinese folk story, Liang Shanbo and Zhu Yingtai, Butterfly Lovers. Why we call this story Butterfly, Butter, Butterfly Lovers? Because Liang Shanbo and Zhu Yingtai loved each other but can't marry. They died at last. Then they became butterflies to seize freedom, to find the, to look for their love. So uh, it is a legend, a uh, folk story known to every Chinese. So I'd like to share it uh, uh, with all of you. This story takes place in Jing Dynasty about 1320 AD. Uh, young, uh, in the feudal China, young people choose their own love, which was considered to be diverse from normal of the society. Liang Shanbo and Zhu Yingtai met each other in school. Actually, most of the women can't go to school in that time. Mm, but Zhu Yingtai was born in a rich family. Her father would like to send her to school, but she must disguise herself as a boy. 
During the three years of study, Zhu Yingtai fell in love with Liang Shanbo, who was unaware of her real identity, a beautiful lady. At departing, Zhu Yingtai invited Liang Shanbo to visit his fa family and told Liang Shanbo, her parents will marry a sister to Liang Shanbo. But Liang Shanbo was short of the money. He delayed the visit. Zhu Yingtai's parents betrothed her to Ma Wencai from a rich family. Later, Liang Shanbo went to visit Zhu. Only then did he realize the sister was actually Zhu Yingtai herself. Liang Shanbo was in deep remorse, felt ill, and died at last. On the day of the wedding, Ma Wencai sent a flower bowl to Zhu's home to bring her bride. When the flower boat for the bride passed Liang Shanbo's tomb, there came a gale, which caused the wave to surge so the boat, the boat could not go any further. Informed that Liang's tomb was on the shore, Zhu Yingtai ran there and knelt down in front of the tomb, waiting bitterly. Suddenly, the skies fell and the earth cracked. Liang's, Liang Shanbo's tomb split open. Seizing this opportunity, Zhu Yingtai jumped into the tomb, and then the tomb closed again, bearing Zhu inside. Then the rain stopped, the sky cleared up. A couple of the butterflies flew from the tomb and danced gracefully among the wild flowers. Butterflies stands for freedom and love in Chinese culture. So uh, this is the folk story, Chinese folk story uh, I'd uh, share with all of you. Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much, Jason. It's actually a very classic Chinese folk tale. Uh, we all knew it when we were kids because the boy was very poor. So he wasn't allowed to marry an upper class girl who was rich because marriage was arranged at time. People were supposed to marry people in their own social class. That's why the two of them were very depressed and died and turned into a butterfly. It's probably based on a true love story, but not the last part, turning into a butterfly. However, there's a moral for the story. Don't interfere with other people's marriage. Otherwise, they might turn into butterflies. <laughs> So, uh, so this is an, an Asian story. We hear an, an South American story. Now I want to invite Judith uh, to tell us uh, a European or several European folk tales. Judith, uh, you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm from Hungary, and uh, I have two stories for you about devils. We have. Um, not just one devil but usually a group of devils and they do like bad stuff or they scare people but they sometimes help so they have um, yeah <laughs> uh, we usually are sad that if we don't go to sleep then the devil takes us away so <laughs> okay the first story is um, the devil and the cobbler um, we have this old myth that if you have too much work to do you can get a devil to do most part of it um, and to get that, um, you need to go on New Year's Eve to an intersection, wait till all the groups of devil passes by you. And then you need to, you can only talk to the last one and you need to say, be my partner. And that devil uh, will go with you and will help with all the work you have in the world. So that cobbler had lots of work and he remembered the story. So on New Year's Eve, he went there into the intersection he talked to the last uh, devil that passed by him. He said, be my partner, and he went with him. It was all good for a while. He helped a lot. He had a lot of work, but there's actually a catch in this story that if you can give work to the devil, then he will take you back to hell. <laughs> so what happened? Uh, that the cobbler knew that, and he needed to be smart. Otherwise, 
the devil would take him to the hell. So he gave him a task, making uh, boots, and uh, he made the thread of the needle so, so long that every time that he needed to pull that thread, he, the devil needed to jump out of the window and back and forth. And by the time he came back, all the thread was so messed up. So basically it was like a never ending task. So that's how the cobbler survived. <laughs> and he would never need to go to hell. So yeah, watch out with the devils. It's never a, just a win-win story. And the other uh, story, it's called uh, Lutza chair. Um, we have this special chair that if you make it and you go on Christmas day at midnight, to an intersection you sit in it then you're gonna see the devils like live right there um it's a really special story we we tell it all the time we have name days in hungary and on the 13th of uh, december it's a name day of lutza which is a female name so two neighbors were really really curious they really wanted to see the devils so they started to make that chair it's, um, you need to start to make it on the 13th of december make it all the way till the first day of Christmas, make it from 13 kinds of woods. And then when it's ready, you go to the intersection, you draw a big circle, you put the chair in the middle, you need to sit in there. And the rule is that when the devils come to your way, then you can't tell anything to them, you can't say anything and you can move from the chair. So they did that. The two neighbors, they were sitting there, they were waiting. And after five minutes after midnight, the devils came in big carriages and horses. <laughs> so they were like, oh my God, this is really happening. They were coming, coming, coming. And uh, they saw like beautiful men were driving the, the, those carriages, but in the carriages, the actual devils, like really ugly and really scary. And they came and uh, when there's a Luta chair in there, then they can't pass by you. So they need to stop. And they stopped and uh, they were yelling at them, well, you need to get out of the street. Otherwise, we're going to kill you right now. The two neighbors were really scared, but they knew the rules. They can't say anything. So they just stayed still. One of the devil came out. He got off the, that carriage and he went close by. He even had a whip in his hand and he started to yell at them. You need to go out now. Otherwise, I'm going to kill you right here, right now. But they still didn't say anything. In the end, the devil was begging to them, please, please. Just get out of our way. We really need to go this way. We have lots of things to do, but they still uh, stayed there. So in the end, all the carriages, they turned backwards and they ran back where they came from. The two neighbors were devastated. They were just really scared forever. And uh, they barely could walk home. And then whenever after that, someone was talking about this Luta chair, they were just saying, it's not worth it. It's, it's way too scary. It's not as fun as it, will, it should be. So that's pretty much it is. We have these devil stories for some reason. <laughs> these are uh, very uh, amazing stories to teach us how to deal with devils. Important lessons to learn. I'm sure it will come handy <laughs> at one point in our lives. But people in that story are all really, really clever. Yeah, they try to be, I guess. It, yeah. There's always like stories with the devil that you need to outsmart them because they're also smart. And then somehow, somehow you need to find a way to trick them because they try to trick you anyway. Uh, I'm going to read a lot about Hungarian stories just to be, to be trained to be smarter in the future. And there's a question for you from Niklas. Uh, she went, he wonders if, if that's not a Hungarian myth, the, the two stories you told. Yeah, they were, um, I found them in a book that um, mostly like village people were telling to each other. So yeah, we have all these different kind of stories, but there's a lot like related to devils, some of them like ghosts, but not really, like they were just really short ones. So I, I thought that's more like representative with devil ones. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's great to have a word collection of ghost stories today. So we not only know the culture of people, but also we know uh, the kind of devils from each country who speak different languages and uh, with different cultural backgrounds. Now I am going to uh, share my dice game again. Uh, we are going to make, an, we are gonna make nine 
the complete uh, make use of the complete nine dices to come up with a more comprehensive story. So let me see if this is working to connect with my phone. I hope this is working. Right. Looks like it takes a while for my uh, mobile phone to connect with the screen to show my screen. I would now like to actually continue the storytelling. Maybe Tracy, uh, if you can share us with, uh, with an NSI UK, go okay. start. Well, um, I was going to tell you a story about the Pendle Witches, which is a a famous, um, a famous story of Lancashire, but I've decided not to because it's a little bit, it's a little bit too long for this. So this is a Lancashire folk tale, um, and there's no devils in it, so it won't give you nightmares. <laughs> Good to long know. Sorry. Good to know. Long ago in a lonely farm not far from the old hall at Salmsbury, there lived an elderly couple named Sykes. Old Sykes and his wife were childless, but, but like most people who have no family of their own, they found other things on which to lavish their affection. And in their case, it was wealth. Not only had he been thrifty, he had also been lucky enough as a young man to find a store of gold, which he kept to himself and spoke of to no one. All their lives, he and his wife were, had pinched and scraped, and in their old age, they were more than well off. Yet they continued to live very frugally. They lived within their means, and year by year, they added money to their fortune. They kept their money in little leather bags, which they concealed in hiding places all over the house. And it was their greatest pleasure to lock all the doors, shutter all the windows, stop up all the chinks, then go from hiding place to hiding place, drawing out the little bags one after another. One was hidden under a flagstone in the floor, one behind a loose brick in the ingle, a third was in a hollow cut in the beam, a fourth behind a panel, a fifth in the hollow leg of the big table. From secret place to secret place they went, like children playing a game, taking out the little bags and arranging them on the great oak table. They never dreamed of spending any of this money. It was enough for them to have it, to fondle it, to bring it out and count it over again and put it away. They fussed over it as if it were a child. So they lived, two harmless misers, until there broke out in the country that war between the followers of Parliament and the supporters of King Charles, which lasted so long and cost so many lives. At times the war seemed to come very close to the two old people. And then, hearing frightening tales of churches being wrecked and houses being burnt down, they began to grow anxious about their money. What would happen if their house was set on fire? Every precious coin would melt in the heat, flow into the ground and never be seen again. In fear and anxiety, they began to consider how to protect themselves. And at last they decided to seal up all their coins in earthenware jars and bury them. They chose an old apple tree that stood at the far end of their little orchard and there under the roots, carefully and weeping tears, they placed the jars which held their treasure. Their wealth was safe enough under the roots of the apple tree. Alas, it was too safe. Before the old people felt it was safe to dig it up again once the war was over, they both died and their secret went to the grave with them. After the funeral, the house was searched from attic to cellar. Every cupboard, every drawer, the walls were tapped and the floor explored. And though hiding places were found, they were all empty. 
After a while, the search was given up and the memory of their wealth began to fade. Nothing was more was heard of the buried treasure for many years, but the house had by then come into the hands of a young man. This young man loved the house as no one since the time of the old lady had loved it. His chief pleasure was sitting in the old orchard, watching the blackbird go from bough to bough, the woodpecker run up the rough trunks and the blossom fall to the grass. One evening he went into the orchard to see the sun going down. The air was very still and warm and when the long level rays of the sun struck across the orchard they shone upon the wings of myriads of little flies. A blackbird went up to one of the top of the top bough of one of the trees and began his long farewell song. On and on he sang while the sun went down and all the colour of the sky began to fade. The young man sat watching and listening to the sweet bird. Then he became aware of someone, a figure, vague but clearly visible, hesitating under the apple tree. He got up and walked over and saw that it was the figure of an old lady. She wore an old fashioned dress of black silk with little white cuffs and a broad white collar and from her waist hung a bunch of keys. Who are you? What do you want? asked the young man. But the lady did not speak. Instead she lifted her arm and the young man saw the blue veins on the pale arm and she pointed downwards to the roots of the apple tree. Why are you pointing there? Again, she was silent. Sadly and earnestly, as if struggling to make clear her intention, but never speaking, she kept pointing at the roots of the apple tree. The next evening, the old lady was there again. And from that time on, she could be seen in rain, in sun, in snow, pointing. For a long time the young man could not understand but one day he told the story to an old friend who lived nearby and he learned then for the first time of the old man and his wife and of the gold that had been lost all those years ago and then he realised that the figure in the orchard was none other than Mistress Sykes herself and she was telling him where to dig the next day he set to work and he worked and as he worked the strange old-fashioned lady came over and stood with him seeming to urge him on and direct his digging it was not long before he came to the buried gold carefully and reverently he lifted out the jars one by one and as the last as the last was lifted the old woman smiled and began to fade and wave. While the blackbird, ignorant of its discovery, sang on from the tree and the little insects danced up and down in the evening sunlight, her form became less and less distinct until at last she vanished and was never seen again. Wow, Tracy, you're an, a great storyteller. Thank you. Yeah. It's, not, it's not scary, but it's. I think it's a nice little story. Yeah. And, and the place it's about is about 15 miles from where I live. So How, that's why I chose it. So did you know the story when you were a child? Or I no, know? no, I didn't. Um, I know, I do know quite a lot of, Lancashire folk stories but they tend to be a bit long um, so I, I had a look in some of my books and I found that one and I thought it was a nice one it wouldn't be too it wouldn't give anyone nightmares <laughs> it's rather sweet if you pay enough attention you might have a fortune revealed to you at some point yeah you never know and it, it the, I think the moral of it is why why put your money away why not enjoy it and use it and help other people with it it's no good buried at the bottom of a tree is it absolutely 
the uh, that that I thought would be the first uh, the the first half stories moral and the, the next half just goes better and better. Yeah, for, thank you. You rewarded eventually. <laughs> Glad nice. you liked it. Yes. So thank you very much, Tracy. In the UK, uh, I wonder, Ploy, Ploy, are you there? Because, hello. Oh, I am. Yep. Yes, Ploy. Um, I know you are a wonderful chef, uh, cooking especially Thai food, and we all love Thai food. Uh, that's why I thought, okay, I would invite you to tell us a folk tale from Thai, because we know Thai food too well, but not enough folk stories from Thai. Yes, so, um, so at first I thought that I would just tell like the folk stories of the um you know like the popular ones but since it's a Halloween so I um I don't think that a lot of people knows about like um the folk stories of ghosts that people believe in Thailand so this I have something here I don't know if you can see there are like a few of them and it's coming to like a cartoons yeah. it looks very um cute but the one that um very popular is um this one, let me zoom in. So this one is uh, has been remade into a lot of um is um like a woman who has no body. It's only like the face and also like the the intestines and the heart. And they um the woman is actually like this ghost usually go into different houses um at night. So um, if you see um, this ghost, <laughs> I know it's cute, but uh, <laughs> because they make it into the cartoon. So if you see this ghost, it's not a good luck. So um, you should stay at home. So I think this ghost should be um, released during this quarantine so people don't get out of the house. <laughs> and another one that um, I think is very um, impactful for a lot of people is this one. This one is also looks cute. Yeah, the, the light is not good, but um, yeah, so technically this ghost is like, a, has a very long arms and long legs. Um, and in order to become this ghost, you need to do something very bad to your parents. What? Like for, yeah, so it's like this ghost is like a re consequences of like children who do not respect um, the parents or um, hurt the parents um, and also like kill the parents. So um, a lot of people like, like perceive that um, you should do something good for your parents because your parents are like the person who give your life and you should not um, hurt your parents even with, um, emotionally and physically. So, um, in order to avoid to be this type of ghost after life, um, you need to um, be nice to your parents and be grateful um, to what they have done to you. So this is like a popular one. And there are some other like folk stories where, um, you know, like people try to tell the folk stories to children. So they, the children try to like, be nice to other people so I think the story is like the same with other culture and other countries like the one that is very popular is like the shepherd like the the kid who is taking care of sheep and then like one day um the this lady was trying to like tell people like oh the, the fox is coming to eat my sheep but she actually lied um to people mm -hmm. to attract attention and this happened like twice. And then um, now like when the fox came to eat her sheep, for real, no one came to help. So that is also like a popular folk stories too. But yeah, so I know it's like, but I think the ghost part is actually very unique um, to Thai culture because I don't know like what, if you have heard about this type of ghost before, but yeah. Uh we, we have that uh, shepherd story, um, which is basically, you can't tell lies. If you tell lies uh, three times, nobody will come to rescue you in the future. 
but uh, we, we also for our traditional value, uh, we are educated to respect our seniors and the parents and grandparents. Uh, however, we haven't created that ghost yet to tell us the punishment if we don't obey the, the senior people. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ploy. And I, I have Jennifer uh, in the UK as well. Jennifer is in a kind of extended family for us. I know Jennifer, you haven't, you have something quite unique for your personal experience. You need to unmute yourself, Jennifer. So Unmute? Yes, that's great. Yeah. Okay. Well, Minji asked me if I had any cultural stories, but I couldn't think of anything. But when I was a child, there was something quite strange that happened. We were taken to a big country house where there was a tennis party for the parents and the parents were busy all afternoon and the children were running around a big country garden and it was it was quite um, quite fun because there were lots of places to hide and um, it was a nice sunny day and we were all running around and then after that there was afternoon tea in a big hall and if you can imagine a big house with a sweeping staircase that came down to the hall, it was quite dark and um, quite old fashioned and quite run down. But these were country people that invited everybody. And while we were all sitting having tea, an old lady came down the stairs and several people saw her and she was wearing quite a long dress. And people said, oh, to the lady whose house it was, is this your mother? And um, she said, no, my mother died quite a few years ago. And this old lady was seen coming down the stairs by quite a few people, including me. And then she just sort of disappeared. And everybody said, did you see that? Did you see that? Um, and it's something I remember from when I was quite a small child. Wow. So, <laughs> so, uh, so if you believe in ghosts, well, I don't know. I think I've seen one. You, you, you definitely bring our uh, Halloween special to a uh, high end by uh, something you experienced yourself as a child. Thank you for sharing with us. Uh, it will make uh, our uh, event special and a spooky day. I am now going to end with the final, our final dice game. For this, I need nine volunteers or maybe eight of them. Can you all see the screen now? Yeah. So I'm gonna touch. And I have a random game, um, random dice. I will again, starting from me, uh, I will choose the icon on the top bottom. Hold on, hold on. Somebody is trying to join in again. Bottom right. Once upon a time, there is a teddy bear. He's very, very, very cute. And he's a huge fan of ice cream. Then over to Joanna, you take over. <laughs> so there was no ice cream shop near the forest where the, uh, the teddy bear lived. So he thought he should go to town because he really, really, wa really wanted some ice cream. So he jumped on his motorbike and headed over to town. Joanna, you choose the next person. <laughs> uh, Judith? So uh, he went into the town and oh, I would choose in the middle is that broccoli. <laughs> okay. <That's, laughs> you think? Okay. So he found an ice cream shop, but it was like a really weird, like healthy town and they only had broccoli flavored ice cream. <laughs> Judith, I never had broccoli ice cream before. <laughs> what a wonderful <laughs> idea. So please choose the next one, the next person. Okay. Um, uh, Gary. Uh -oh. Gary, there you go. <clears throat> so <laughs> since, uh, since he didn't like the broccoli ice cream, uh, it tasted kind of like uh, stale mushrooms. And so as a result of that, <clears throat> am I, am I, um, you need to choose a dice, Gary. Yes, okay. So 
uh, he uh, got on the telephone. This is the, <laughs> and said, um, is, he called uh, the police department because it was, uh, he thought maybe they would know about um, uh, ice cream. So they, he said, I, I've stopped at this bro broccoli ice cream place and it's just terrible. Uh, can you help me? Uh, and then they suggested, yes, we've got some that's um, a, uh, a fruit-based and it's the, the one above the telephone. Fruit-based and it's at a, at a shop that's very close to you. So Gary, thanks for calling the police for our teddy bear. Can you name the next person? <laughs> okay, the next person <laughs> is Ploy. Ploy, you go next. Um, yeah, and after the police suggested, um, so um, they end up buying the lemon to squeeze on top of the broccoli ice cream to add more citrus flavor. <laughs> I think this is so, even getting better. <laughs> lemon with broccoli. Ploy, you name the next one. Um, the next one um, can be um, Terumi. Harumi Chow, here we go, food fan. <laughs> so you need to unmute yourself, choose a dice and continue the story. Uh, I will choose, oh. Okay, so I will choose the uh, is this us? Us? The uh, the middle, the left hand side. Uh, the middle. Earth, yes, the earth, earth globe, yes, our earth. Okay. The teddy bear tried to improve the ice cream taste nest. So he tried to um, collect all the information from the us all <laughs> over the world. And uh, one day he got the good answer from the our quiz. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, this is the most global teddy bear I have ever met, met in my life. Terumi, <laughs> would you please choose the next person to take it over? Okay. Hmm? I couldn't find. Mother? Are you able to find people's names? Ah, okay. So I'll choose Michelle. Michelle. Please go next. <laughs> okay. So the teddy bear was, um, he didn't like the ice cream that he was uh, eating. So he decided to go to to talk in public with everyone to tell them that he was um, he, did, he didn't like the ice cream so he decided to go to public and, and ask for help because he really wants to to enjoy his ice cream see his ice cream yeah <laughs> after calling the police and giving a public speech to look for yeah. the ice cream <laughs> So Michelle, you <laughs> oh sorry, uh, I need to reconnect. Uh, somehow, I hope my phone works. Um, so Michelle, you need to choose the next person. And the dice left is one angry face and the one uh, dice of a person going upstairs. The next person can choose between the one of them. Okay, and uh, the next one is going to be um, Mike. <laughs> Mike, can you unmute yourself? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. So, um, he was, um, the teddy bear was trying to convince everybody in the world that broccoli flavoured ice cream was the best. Um, because he didn't want to eat any more broccoli flavored ice cream. And he thought if he could persuade everybody else to eat broccoli flavored ice cream, then he wouldn't have to eat broccoli flavored ice cream anymore. <laughs> the problem was that 
the more people who ate broccoli flavored ice cream, the more angry they got. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mark, please choose the last person to finish the story for us today. <laughs> There's only one person to choose. That's Minji. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to choose the final icon, the man getting up the stairs. So, uh, because everybody uh, gets angry, so eventually the ice cream, hold on, let me just stop sharing. The yeah, ice cream manufacturer decided to improve the recipe <laughs> for broccoli flavored everything. So now we have broccoli flavored toothpaste, shampoo, ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's why eventually the last icon was this teddy bear because of his contribution to world peace he was uh, going upstairs to receive the uh, award from sweden the world nobel prize for peace uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> sorry so uh, thank you very much guys for spending one hour of your Evening, morning, afternoon for our storytelling from around the world. I hope that brings not only spookiness, but also some happiness for uh, your special Halloween. I want to invite Joanna to tell us what will happen next week. Next week, Joanna. Next week, we're going to get down into the sewers of London. Yes. So next week. Uh, Joanna and I, we are going to organize a quiz. Talk. The quiz is called After All the Shit. We are going to talk about all the history and story about the shit uh, we've done after each time we go to our bathroom. So uh, next week, same time, After All the Shit. See you guys. Happy Halloween. Bye.